Hey, yo, shout out and welcome to the legend, Detroit News, Rod Beard. Brother, how are you doing today? And take it away with Rod. Gentlemen, 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 it must be Wednesday. It's must Wednesday. be Wednesday. But but it, the NBA free agency still is absolutely the best of all of the free agency. Yeah, I don't care what people say about the NFL. We know it's not the NHL or, or MLB. But you got Clay Thompson in a Mavs uniform. What what are we doing? Yeah. You got Chris Paul <laughs> going to the Spurs. Wow. It's, it's like you're playing musical chairs with teams, and then people just end up in the weirdest places. And I'm not saying it's not going to fit. I like Clay uh, positionally and where he would play in Dallas, but it's just weird. Just people that you've known to be in certain jerseys for their entire careers moving to different places. And so it'll create some storylines, definitely. It would definitely create some storylines. It, it was I know JB Smooth is over here in the TD space today, and uh, he's a, a Golden State Warriors supporter. And just uh, seeing Clay Thompson and this Warriors team start to break down, this legendary Warriors team start to break down. It's been tough on him. He's over here shaking his head in despair <laughs> right now. It is. It's going to be weird, you know. Clay Thompson with the Dallas Mavericks. They're a squad that were just in the finals. Hopefully, he can help put them over the top. Hopefully he doesn't become like Patrick Ewing on the Magic or Hakeem Elijah oh, one on the God. Raptors. I don't think he will. Don't I think that. I think Clay has more game left in him than those respective players did. But you always run that risk when you change teams like that that late in your career. Yeah, hey, I mean, but, if you're choosing, if you're choosing, do you identify Draymond as a warrior more than Clay as a warrior? That's a legit ooh, question. Damn. Ooh. Mm, yeah, that's tough. <sighs> that's a legit one. Rank the Warriors. I. The same, right? They have to be. Yeah. That's like trying to, in some parts, separate. You know, when you think about that going to work Pistons squad, yeah. Yeah, it's really, really, really difficult to say which one was the one or uh, which one was above the other. I mean, they'll probably both be in the Hall. I mean, Clay Thompson, definitely. Draymond, yeah, they'll He's probably both be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. He's a Hall of Fame. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question, though, man. Yeah, great question. That's one we're going to have to uh, discuss on the show a little bit later. But, um. Oh, no. You got to get right back on get back call drop to you. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely because I, what I want to be able to do is I want to ask him about Jaden Ivy. That's what I'm going to do. And this Detroit Pistons start lineup, I, and I think that's the nuanced way I want to be able to ask about his opinions because I don't think that there's too many people who believe that that Jaden Ivy is Here a bad player. Like, I'm not available to take your call, but please. Leave <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're going to figure out we're what's going on with that. Technical difficulty. It's all right. Yeah, because I don't I don't think that there's a lot of people out there who believe that Jaden Ivey is a bad player. And, you know, shout out to Speak Easy who's in the in the chats. This one thing that he's been talking about for a while is the fit with Jaden Ivey next to Cade Cunningham. And I don't know if it's necessarily a Cade Cunningham specific thing or not, but just in general in this lineup. So I, I'm hoping I see KG talking to Rod now. We'll try and get him back on here soon because I'm really intrigued to see what his opinion is on this starting lineup for the Detroit Pistons moving forward. Yeah, I mean, it's looking like right now that obviously it's going to be Cade and then either Tim Hardaway Jr. or Malik Beasley at the two. And that's that's the uh, – Let's ask – Let's ask, ask Rod. Beard. Let's yeah. ask Rod. Hey, Rod, hey. you back with us, brother? Yep, got you. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Look, man, we've been talking about Jay and Ivy. We're looking at all of the additions that Trajan Langdon and the Detroit Pistons front office has made. And they've made some pretty shrewd moves. Shout out to Blackstone in the front office who – has been helping Trajan Langdon a lot with the cap space management. But Jade and Ivy, man, Jade and Ivy is the guy who I'm just like, okay, what's happening with this Pistons squad? Especially when you think about the starting lineup. Is he a guy that is still destined, as we once believed to be, to be the starting two guard for this squad? Or do you see things shaking out a little bit different for this Pistons start lineup this season? And uh, I guess I think- kind of a follow-up is what role do you see for Ivy? I think right now he's a sixth man. For me, because I want to get off to a good start. I want the leadership of a Malik Beasley or a Tim Hardaway Jr. to start the season instead of the other way around. And if, things, if you start Ivy and things don't go well, then you go to your vet. I think you let Ivy figure it out. And, and not to say that he's a rookie and he doesn't know what he's doing, but in a six-man role, I think he can, he can give you the energy off the bench and I think with Cade specifically, you need that shooting around him to start the game. I, I just I like the look of that a little bit more. And I and, and I know people think a little bit different. When I put the question out on uh, Twitter yesterday, people were all over the place about Ivy has to start. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think he can be an effective six man and provide some energy off the bench. Yeah, and I'm glad that you stated that because I did. As soon as I saw your your post yesterday on X. 
I sent it to the crew and I said, you know what, we got to talk to Rod about this on uh, Wake Up Woodward uh, during our Woodward Business segment. And you had some pretty cool wing combinations. Do you have the results or at least how that – that shook out, and uh, what's your combination for uh, for this Detroit Pistons uh, starting lineup? Mine is is Beasley Fontecchio. I, I, if okay. Beasley can start for for um, for Dallas, he can start for me. Mm. It, it, that's just how it works. It, it, I, I think he's a or, or start for the Bucks. I'm sorry. If he can start for them, he can start for me. Yeah. And Hardaway, same sort of deal. If he can start enough games for them, what's to say that he can't start for the Pistons and provide some of that same. Um, experience that same three-point shooting. I think that's the biggest thing. You can come with the second unit and and have the other be the three-point shooter with Ivy kind of directing that group with Sasser in the backcourt. I think that's a, a different formula that I would see working out a little bit better. I am so glad that you mentioned <laughs> Malik because you kind of mentioned one of the same points that I've been thinking of when it comes to Malik Beasley. He's a guy that started 79 games on the Bucks last year. He does shoot the yeah. three ball better throughout his career than Tim Hardaway Jr. If you can play on a starting lineup with with Giannis, with Brooke Lopez, That's with Chris true. Middleton, with Dame Lillard, a team that would have gone farther in the playoffs if it weren't for Giannis being hurt, you can start for the Detroit Pistons. And conversely, Tim Hardaway Jr. only started 12 games, and he was out of the rotation come playoff time. I'm not saying I don't want him on, on the Pistons. Glad to have him. It's just if it were me... I would probably agree with your wing combination and put Beasley and Fontecchio and then Tim Hardaway Jr. be the two guard off the bench. And you know what? I actually, I like that. I like that. Fontecchio, because we were talking about it a little bit uh, during the break, and I was like, you know what? The discernible skills of a Beasley beyond just shooting, is it enough in that starting lineup? And it's like, you know, if it's enough for the Bucks, it's definitely enough yeah, for the, yeah. the historically bad Detroit Pistons. And when you talk about uh, adding a Fontecchio, um, to this lineup all season, not the 16 and 19 games that he played last year. You're talking about a whole lot more shooting in this lineup right now, and that's where things get interesting with the Jaden Ivey. And I saw somebody saying, I wish I had the comment, they said that the three-point shot has broken basketball. And I, I think that it's challenging players more. In the past, you could rely on a lot of the skills that Jaden Ivey had and get by. In the past, you could rely on, we talked about Andre Drummond being a, a big man who maybe 20 years ago, perfect error for him but he got caught yeah. in the switch and we saw if you can't if you can't find a way to evolve and adapt it's going to leave you behind Jaden Ivey though has enough skill and he's shown me enough that I do believe he will thrive but as a six-man role if you tell him right now this is your discernible role and your discernible skill go out there and work at it when you yeah. come in be that Jake Crawford be that absolute just barn burner for us I do believe that that could be a good role for him yeah. for I'm still for him starting 14 points at your six spot is not bad at all it's not it's not and, and you but know here's, what? Here's, here's the other thing, though. If, why, did, why, did you, why would you go out and get Beasley and Hardaway mm. if, if you weren't going to start one of them? You, you go and get two very solid wings, and you're, you're going to still just start Ivy? That doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. And, and in terms of the salaries, you didn't pay a ton. It's not like going to get Tobias Harris and you know you have to start him because you're paying him that number. Yeah. But – if you're going to get two vets, is it to back up Ivy? Possibly, but I think you want to be solid. And that, and, and judging by what Trajan Langdon's comments were in the, in his presser, it was we need vets to augment this young roster. You can't have a ton of young guys running the show here. You need a few guys to sprinkle in that starting lineup to give them some leadership and to make those games closer early on. Yeah, and just to, just to piggyback on that uh, really quickly, that was one of the things we talked about with Trajan Langdon is how does he see this roster? He's not connected to any of these young guys. We knew that Kay Cunningham was going to get that contract because he's connected to the organization. But Trajan Lane is able to come in here and assess with unbiased, non-connected eyes to these young players that uh, were brought in here through, via the previous regime and just make the actual best decision for the basketball team. Yeah. yeah. Yo, and Rod, one of the things that I like is in real time, I the gears were kind of shifting in my head on this. You think about the Pistons and their depth, given the fact that they just added Paul Reed yesterday. I start to think, and if we're assuming we're going off of the Beasley-Fontecchio wing pairing, you've got on the bench, you've got Asar Thompson, you've got Ron Holland, you've got Paul Reed, you've got Beef Stew, you've got Marcus Sasser, you've got Jaden Ivey, you've got guys who have shown skill sets in the NBA or are top five draft picks. My question is, is there going to be an odd man out by the time the season starts? Yes, and what this, suggest, 
what what this suggests to me is there's going to be a trade because now with all the people you've mentioned, you can't have an eleven man rotation. Right. Who's the odd man out in yeah. that? You and, and if there are eleven people, there's some kind of trade coming or or something. It it just smells like that. That maybe one of the young guys, maybe maybe you just say, hey, Holland is just not going to be in the rotation. He'll get spot minutes here and there. Maybe that's the answer to this thing. But this looks like there's there's some type of trade, and maybe you get you move one of the younger guys, maybe Thompson, maybe Ivy, maybe somebody else like that. I don't know. I don't have any inside info, but I'm just saying I'm guessing looking by the number of people and which people they brought in, this there's going to be an odd man, maybe two out in the way this is set up. Man, and, and you know what? And I, with this Jay and Ivy uh, conversation, just to kind of put a bow on it, I'm not, I'm not putting a cap on his ceiling, but I'm also glad that Trajan Landon is doing something a little bit better than we saw out of the Pistons last year. The Pistons just seem to say, you know what? We're just assessing these young guys again, and they didn't do a lot to put them in a position to to, to thrive, to succeed. What if Jay and Ivy in a six man role gets the opportunity to to you know uh, starting off from the bench, learn by seeing other experienced players ahead of him doing it the right way, and then get the opportunity to come in with a little bit less stress and pressure that goes on with starting, and is able to find a role that he's able to grow into, even if that's eventually a starter. And so I'm I'm glad that Trajan Langdon is able to come in here with the eyes that he has and is just able to say, you know what, let's put these guys in their best positions. I don't care if you're a starter or if you're not a starter. And I think you needed a guy like that who was disconnected from the situation, a part of other winning organizations, to come in with his eyes, assess what's here, and, and say, you know what, this is what needs to be. Yeah, Good, KG. big facts. Uh, Ry, I actually have two questions for you, the first one being um, with all the moves that Trajan has made so far, um, how would you grade the Pistons offseason up until this point? I would say a, a, a strong B. I mean, they, they didn't, and, and we talked about this for, for most of the spring. I wanted a big Zach Levine type thing, and, and you see the rest of the league isn't touching any of that, that, that contract type stuff with Levine anyway. Um, we talked about Tobias. They've spent the money well. Positionally, they've got the, the needs that they needed to fill and haven't broken the bank to do it and haven't really gotten a long-term deal. I think, for, and you mentioned Michael Blackstone, I think they've done smart things. Are they going to go out and win 40 games? Probably not. Maybe not with this roster, but they've done smart things. So I will give them a B on, on just this is a better roster going out into the start of the season, assuming this is it. But All right. if, if they do nothing else, this is a B. All right, and then my, my second question was uh, J.B. Bickerstaff. He's having his press conference today. Is there anything in particular that you would like to hear uh, from J.B. Bickerstaff, and do you think that there's a particular direction he should take with this uh, team? No, I don't, I don't think there's anything in particular I want to hear. I think it's, it's, it's just sort of the same thing that um, – Langdon laid out was that this is going to take time. There isn't some, hey, we're ready to go and we out here about to hit the play in. It's, I don't want to hear that. But I want to hear, hey, we're, we're going to take these young guys and work with them and mold this into a team that the city can be proud of. That's, that, give me one sentence like that and I'm good. 